Hello and welcome to Milkshake Monday, episode 70, when ordinary amazes the world. Now, I got to tell y'all something. I feel like being on a soapbox for about a couple minutes. A lot of things that amaze us right now in the world are things that come with riches and wealth and entertainment and sparkly things. You know, if we want to watch the Housewives of Potomac or Orange County or Basketball Wives or look at Big Brother or all this stuff that they got as reality TV, we just think that's so fascinating and amazing. We want to see how somebody wants to have a, hick, a hookup with this person and next week do a little thing with this bachelor and all that stuff we find entertaining. Well, I want us to think about something. Have you noticed that a lot of that bizarre behavior, all of that kind of wanting to have sparks and sizzle has found its way in the house of worship, the house of prayer in churches? Because with the kids leaving and you finding that the young people don't want to be bothered with the things of God, it seems like the pastors and the trustees and all these people want to do things to get them in, to draw them in, to kind of market ourselves a little bit differently. And where we find that just preaching the word of God, that's not enough. They don't want traditional, they want contemporary. All these things we're doing to try to be so on the top amazing that we'll bring the people in. But Christ said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw them in. And tonight we're going to talk about how ordinary. Ordinary does not mean boring. Ordinary doesn't mean plain, but ordinary means that you and I and we as a collective body of Christ can do what the word of God says, and it will be amazing to the world. And so we're going to have some opportunities to see that. But I wanted to just picture this because I want to bring home the point of how we've taken things that God has said are to be done in the house of God, and we've kind of gotten to the point where we're being just like the world. Imagine yourself. You're out about, you're at a local grocery store. And around the corner, somebody says, guess what? T.D. Jakes is around the corner buying some butter. <gasps> T.D. Jakes? Oh, I gotta get his autograph. I gotta go see him. I gotta tell everybody I saw him. Let me take a selfie. Or Yolanda Adams is at the Walmart. Oh, we gotta go over there and see Yolanda because I love her albums. Or Kirk Franklin. And, you know, we know he got his, his radio station. Or maybe it's some other person like Joel Osteen or Joyce Meyer, all these people we find as exciting and we want to go see them. We want to have evidence that we saw them. But you got to remember, these are people. These are sinners, just like you and I. They don't have any greater place in the kingdom of God than you accepting Jesus Christ and me accepting Jesus Christ. Because you see them on TV, or they sing, they have a microphone, they have a TV uh, broadcast, whatever that stuff is, don't get twisted because it's not by their power or any of their godliness or my godliness that anybody has something to say, we're the star. We are people who are changed of God and because of what they see in us of Jesus Christ, that's what amazes them. That's what amazes them when we're going to talk about a couple of people who are just regular folks. Regular folks who have spent time with Jesus makes them extraordinary, takes the ordinary that all of us are and makes us extraordinary. Now, I want to talk about the word ordinary because some of us in the body of Christ and all of the congregations all over the world, all over the world, there are so many of us that think of us not as ordinary, but think of us as inadequate, as frightened, as we don't, we don't even want to open our mouths to talk about Jesus because we don't know enough. We don't think that we're good enough to be the person to go out and tell them. You need to get that person to do it. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to have somebody say to us, so we don't know them and we don't know how they're going to react to us. But the reality is you are enough in Christ. With the Holy Spirit working on you as that comforter, that helper, that, that spirit being that's going to be with you every step of the way, leading and guide you, guiding you, that's enough for the word of God to be spread. But why we find that our churches are overflowing with people believing in the word of God is because we're too afraid. We think that we're so in ordinary 
and inadequate that we can't go talk to him about Jesus. It's, that's just not us. That's somebody else. She can do it. She's, she's ready for that role. But all of us have the gifts of God in the church. It's not the 20% that should be doing it. All of us have a part. You don't know what your part is? Seek God and ask God. And God will show you. And the Holy Spirit will direct you. So let's go to Acts chapter 3 and 4. And I want you to understand something. When you see what God does in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, you'll see that God uses the blue collar, the white collar, the kingly collar, the queenly collar. It doesn't matter. He's used carpenters. He's used doctors. He's used treasurers. He's used harlots. He's used every person, no matter what. Homeless, people that are not mentally sound, out of their mind, people that have five husbands, you can, widows, everybody is in God's army. You're no different. I don't care if you're black, you're brown, you're blue, you're green, you're purple. I don't care if you got a job, you don't got a job, if you're rich, if you're poor. All of that stuff is exterior. God is looking on the inside of you and he needs you and he wants you to be a part of his message to this world so people can know who he is and why he came. This Thanksgiving we all just celebrated. There were some people that probably didn't feel love this past Thanksgiving. Didn't probably feel thankful because they said, well, I got to be thankful. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares. But we are the voice of God. We are the messengers of God to share with them how important they are to him. So much that he said, Father, I'm going to come down through 42 generations and I'm going to show them my love that I want to give my life so that they can have life everlasting and have access to you, Father. And while I'm here with you praying for them, I got the Holy Spirit down there and I need to reach her. I need to reach him and I'm going to use all of you and Anita and everyone who's willing to do the work. So let's see in chapter three of Acts, what's going on? You got two brothers in Christ, fishermen, One's a fisherman. And if y'all know anybody about who does fishing, fishermen have a smell about fish. Fishermen have them hard hands that have been out there working the nets, being out in the sea. That's nobody that anybody would think was special, but he's walked with Christ. And so has John. So here in verse one, it says, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer in the ninth hour. And you're like, okay, what's that about? You're going to see them doing their normal thing. Your normal thing may be you going over to the store. Your normal thing may be you go over to work. Maybe you're going over to see family. Maybe you go on just to do your normal thing, going to get your mail. I don't know what your normal may be, but God is always going to orchestrate some time where you're on your normal and God just says, okay, I need to go left. And you have to be willing to listen and obey and follow the direction of the Spirit. So here's Peter with John, and they're going to the temple to pray. And it says, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they said they laid daily at the gate, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who enter the temple. Y'all got it. We got beggars. You go down the street, go near the metro, wherever you go, you see people on the street near your car saying, I'm homeless. I don't have any money. This man here at the gate, beautiful, was begging. Y'all know about what that's about. It says here, who seeing Peter, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. He wants some money. He wants a dollar. He wants some quarters. He wants some money. And fixing his eyes on him. This is Peter looking at that man, not walking past him, not ignoring him, not acting like he didn't hear, like some of us do. It says, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. And the guy, I love it how the scripture explains things. If you just take the time to read it, it says, so the guy says, so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them, dollar bill, some money. In this case, then Peter said in verse six, silver and gold, I do not have, but what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Rise up and walk. The reason why I tell you this is because as you start to see what happens, people, 
start to realize that something miraculous has happened. The guy realizes because he wasn't able to walk and now he can. Some things that you're going to be a part of, you're going to do some things for Christ in the name of Jesus. And people are going to say, oh, did you see her transformation? Oh, did you see this? Did you see how they were able to? And you got to say, it wasn't me. I, I didn't get blessed because just of me. I was blessed by the Lord God so that I could be a blessing to others. He did this so I could go and share about who he is and how he did this and how I'm not special. I'm his child and I can tell you that he loves you the same as he loves me. But here this guy, rise up and walk is what they said. Now, verse 7 says, and he took, and he took him by the hand and lifted him up and immediately... His feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping and praising God. Now you're going to see this guy going to start to hold on to Peter and John. Like, I don't know what's just happened. I've been, I've had a miracle. Show sure enough. I wasn't able to walk. Now I'm walking. And so he's excited. He hadn't been able to use those legs for years. And it says, verse nine, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. And, and at the back of and that the beggar that always bothers me when I come into the temple. He's leaping and praising God in the temple. They so busy looking at him. They're not looking to say, I need to be praising God. But it says, then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement. Here's where it starts. Peter and John have done a miracle in the name of Jesus. But the wondering and amazement has started. By believers acting on the word of God, the spirit of God, by the name of God. And the people are reacting. These are church folks because they're inside the synagogue. They're in the temple. And it says, here's a wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, verse 11 says, now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's Greatly amazed. All this amazement. They're amazed because this man has had a show enough miracle. He was lame and now he is walking around and jumping around and shouting for joy. He ain't begging for us because he's walking. He's able body right now. And he's holding on to these two guys, Peter and John. What's happened? All they can be is amazed if something has happened. Now it says here, verse 12. So Peter, when he saw it, what did he see? He sees that the guy's been healed. He knew that because he helped him get up. So it's not that he's been healed that's amazed Peter because Peter said it in the name of Jesus and he believed it was going to happen. But then you see, he's seeing the reaction of the folks on the porch. He's seeing the guys holding tight on him. He's been, he's had a, a, a miracle of strength back in his legs and ankle bones. But all these people are around being amazed and astounded, it seems. It says, so when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? And, he, and they're probably like, didn't you see the man that was just raised up? And it's like, yeah, he saw it. He says, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us? As though, now here's the part that we got to make sure we do not get confused. When God uses you, and you have a platform for Christ, don't think the star is on you. You are not the star. The star is always Jesus. The Holy Spirit is leading others to Christ for them to know who Christ is as the Savior, as the Lord, as the intercessor, not us. But it says here, he says, or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk. It wasn't us. The, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up. Now he's going down history back to the thing. Because I want to tell y'all something. When you have superficial faith, when you have stargazing faith, when you have superficial faith, you come one Sunday and we'll miss you for the next three. You come in because somebody's singing your song this week and, and we won't see you again. You'll, you'll be saying Hosanna as he's coming in on the donkey. And then when you get some kind of uh, provocation by the chief priest, you'll be saying crucify. 
because you're not committed. You flaky. That's my one of my favorite words y'all hear all the time. I, flaky Christians are all around. But here he's saying, y'all are the ones that crucified Christ because he was telling you the truth. And while he was here, he did signs and wonders, but he was the one, not us. Now that y'all don't see him, y'all trying to put all that gaze on us. Y'all don't want to get it twisted. It's not us. It's still him. We are his ambassadors. We are his disciples. But here it speaks to, now I want you to tell, he told, told him in verse 14, but you denied the Holy One. And some of us that say we love Christ, but won't go to church. We won't give to the church. We won't pray. Only time we have any kind of uh, thoughts of the of church is if somebody's in the hospital, somebody's dying, somebody's sick, you in trouble. That's when you know God. But other than that, you ain't got time to be bothered. And this is what some of us are doing, verse 14. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Maybe y'all not asking for murderers, but you asking for boyfriends and girlfriends and I want to sleep in on Sunday or I want to do something else with my money. My time. But let's jump down. It says here, verse 15, and kill the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. That's what we are. We are witnesses. That's what they get amazed from. When you boldly go out and witness Christ, that's what the world will be amazed because they will be amazed to hear the truth, no matter what the consequences. They'll be amazed to know that you are bold enough to share who God is in your life. Give your testimony. Explain to them how you didn't deserve nothing. You didn't deserve the house, the car, that American dream lie that all of us are fighting for or giving all our energy for. It's a lie. You can get the houses, you can get the cars, you can get the land, you can get the jewelry, you can get the money, the wealth, all that crap you see on TV that these crazy folks have. You can live in a big brother house and have all this stuff and you just as nutty because that's not what makes people happy. And once we can share with our children, with our spouses, with our friends, that the American dream without Christ is a lie, it's a nightmare. That's what we got to get straight. But here he's saying something. He's saying in verse 17, let me finish 16. And, and his name through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all, not us, but because of Christ. Verse 17 says, yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance. Talk about you, you didn't accept Christ. You rejected him. Now, what, what are we saying for those who say that they love God? Are you in ignorance that you know God says forsake not the assembling together? Are you in ignorance that God says come before me with, with, it was, with a joyful heart? Let everything that has praise a breath, praise the Lord. Are y'all going to say y'all ignorant? Y'all didn't, didn't really figure that out. Oh, they didn't tell me enough to, for me to understand. You're going to try to wait till you die in breath and then try to get it right. Don't do that. Don't do that, saints. Well, here we go. But, verse 18, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Now, I want y'all to jump over to chapter four, because here we go. They, he's, he, meaning Peter is talking and John is there and the people are hearing about Christ. Transition to chapter four. And here's where, even when you start to see that you are proclaiming Christ and people are believing and, and people are being, re receiving the message of Christ and your boldness is being proclaimed, there's people that are going to be disturbed. People that don't like to have the attention taken from them to you, which is not to you, it's to Christ. They are used to getting everybody to pay attention to them. So they're going to be greatly disturbed. And you're going to see a whole group of people. You're going to see Sadducees and scribes and peoples coming all over the place. Even they said a chief priest and all his family was coming. Everybody's coming. But I want you to see their attitude as they're coming. Because they're not coming with gladness and joyfulness. It says here in verse Let's see, verse two of chapter four says, being greatly disturbed. It's all the folks coming who are hearing the message of Christ, but they're coming disturbed. The attitude ain't right. Shouldn't they be happy that the man just got a miracle? They know it's not Jesus in, in his flesh, 
But they see his disciples are still saying stuff by his name and they're greatly disturbed because they thought they got rid of Jesus. And here his disciples are still proclaiming him. And that's the same thing with you and I. We should be proclaiming Christ every day. And it says, being greatly disturbed that they taught, Peter and John, taught the people <laughs> and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. However, verse four, however, they had already pre preached and talked to people about Jesus. They'd already done a show no miracle in the name of Jesus Christ. It says, however, many of those who heard the word, that's what you got to do. Hear the word. People will be amazed at the truth because when the spirit of God is leading you to speak the word in boldness, in the name of Jesus, the spirit is drawing. The spirit is pricking people's hearts to know that they are loved that Christ came for them. It says, however, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. That's a lot of people getting saved from the word of God, just for a man that they saw as a beggar getting healed, and them telling him about Jesus being the healer. Well, here's what's going on. You got Anna, Annas, the high, high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family, I told you family came, were gathered together in Jerusalem. Now here's what's going to happen. Verse 8 says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers, everybody's, all these people, 5,000, the rulers of them, they're priests, they're people that are in charge of their ministry, their pastors and teachers and stuff. They are coming and they're seeing their folks just started believing in Jesus. So Peter's starting to address them. He says, filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. It says, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means has he been made well? Let it be known to you all and to all the peoples of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. He keep bringing that nail right back to them to say, y'all did this. But even with that, God is still merciful and kind and has done a miracle through this helpless beggar at the gate beautiful. Now, what's going to stir them up is because they wanted to kind of quash all this. They wanted to get it over with and say it didn't happen. But I want you to jump down to verse 12 and 13. It says here, nor is salvation in any other means. And he's talking about Jesus Christ. You can't get salvation other than Jesus Christ. It says here, now is there salvation in any, nor, excuse me, is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is it. It says, verse 13, now when they saw, this is all the rulers, elders, members of, of Caiaphas' house, everybody, but the people that really don't like and thought they'd taken care of Jesus, now they got Peter and John, but they said, now when they saw the boldness of Peter, and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. Some places call it common. I'm telling you, ordinary folks. They marveled. They don't like what they're saying. They don't want to hear what they're saying. They want to stop what they're saying. But the world and the people that don't like you will marvel when the word of God is proclaimed boldly. You speak the truth. You trust God that if the Holy Spirit is leading you to talk to the folks, one person at a time, two people at a time, 10 people at a time, it doesn't matter. You trust God and let them marvel at the thing that they see and hear of the name of Jesus Christ and your boldness of faith to proclaim his name, not your name, but his name. It says they marveled and they realized, here's the kicker. They realized that they had been with Jesus and they wanted to shut him up. And, and, and at the end of this scripture in chapter four, I mean four, it says basically, for we cannot but speak, verse 20, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They have to listen to God. I wanted to end tonight about something other. If you think about, I told you a list of all those different regular folks. 
We've learned the woman at the well, the woman with the issue of blood, the widow that gave two mites. You know, Joseph was a carpenter, was the stepfather of Jesus. You knew John the Baptist was was elderly parents that had been barren, and he was out in the wilderness. You know, all of these different people who are just normal, who are just available, accessible for God to use. I want you to go to John chapter six. I can't read it all because of time, but I want you to understand something. If you were at the right place, at the right time, doing the right things with the right people, I used to hear that all the time when I went to full gospel years ago. I want to add something with the right heart, with the right heart to give and to be used of God. No matter what small thing you may have, God can use it to meet the needs of many and people will marvel and the testimony will be for generations to come that you may never see. In this part in John chapter six, Jesus is marveling at all the the multitudes that's there and he's wanting to feed them. And he says to one of his disciples, you gotta get some bread for these folks. And the disciples like, you know, 200 denarii, still wouldn't feed these folks. They wouldn't have but a little, and that wouldn't be enough. But Christ is, is saying stuff because he already knows what he's going to do. He already knows how it's going to be done, but he wants to show his disciples who he is. And some of us listening and experiencing day-to-day life, we want to know and have to realize who Christ is, that we are with Christ. He's our Savior and our Lord, and we need to let him lord over us. Lord over our decisions, Lord over our past, because we're making decisions and we're not following after that, that, that song that says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to our own understanding, but in all our ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct our path. Well, here's some things that he's in verse five of chapter six. Says, then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him. He said to Philip, remember the Philip that was talking to the Ethiopian and had to speak to the word of God? Philip is going to have transformation. But he says, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that we may eat? He just asked him, where where, where will you get some groceries for these people? You know exactly where you're going to get groceries. You're going to get it from the Father. But he want to ask Philip, where can we get some groceries? Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him. See, the Lord doesn't tempt you, but the Lord will test you. To test him. For he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered to him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. Now here's Andrew the introducer. The, the common person, the ordinary person, the person that may never, we never need to know his name. But all of us know about the young lad, the young boy, who thought it important to come and hear who Jesus was as a little boy. With a sack lunch, with a little lunch, he was there to listen to Jesus. And he had his little lunch. Maybe his mom and daddy packed it for him because he just wanted to hear Jesus. And they let him go. He'd be safe with the crowd because they all listening to the prophet as they saw it, the rabbi, the master. And this little boy had a willing heart. He was at the right place, listening to the right person with the right heart to give what he had. And it says here, Verse 8 says, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad, this ordinary boy, this boy that doesn't know much but to come hear Jesus. There's a lad who must have told Andrew, he has some food. You can have my food if you need some food. Not understanding the crowd, but he's saying, he probably said, you can have my food. I'll share. How many of us are like that young lad? We're willing to share. We're willing to to go and give what we have in our houses, our cars, our refrigerator food, our our abilities, our talents, the things that God can use in your houses of worship. Are you willing to say, here, here, I got a little bit. You can have what I have. Here it is here. It says, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Andrew didn't even realize who Christ was. Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. He already knew what he was going to do. And he said, oh, I got that young man's ordinary little sack lunch. I'm going to show y'all how I make the ordinary extraordinary. And he says, make them sit down. Now there was much grass in this place. 
So the men sat down in the number about 5,000, a lot of folks. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, his disciples distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. They could have seconds, folks. Five fishes and two loaves, and now we, we are able to do seconds. And if you read on to the story, they had, let's read on. So when they were filled, the folks were hungry, they were filled. He said the disciples gathered up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves. When God gives you, he gives you more than enough. And he expects you to take what you have and to share it and give and give his word to others so that they can be amazed about Christ. Not about you, but about Christ. I just share and ask all of us to get more commitment. We're getting ready to go through December and we have the holidays of, of Christmas and then people making New Year's resolutions, all this stuff. I pray that we who know Christ will get serious about proclaiming Christ. You never know where your testimony of who he is will change somebody's life, may save somebody's life, to save them from an eternity in hell where there are no exit signs. So I just pray that you become the person that Christ can use. You don't have to be a preacher. I'm not a preacher. I'm Nita. I'm Nita. And I have to study and read and ask the Holy Spirit every week, tell me what you want me to share of your word, because I'm learning just like you. But put yourself out there to ask God, what would you have me to do for your kingdom? He'll answer. If you really have a heart to work and work as unto the Lord for whatever he gets you to do, he'll put you to work. And as I always end the teaching every week, I say, the harvest is ripe, but the labors are few. We need everyone to open their mouths about the word of God. I love you and Lord willing, I'll see you next week.